Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Amish Phil is back. The show technically started now, but we've been talking for 25 minutes, and I know Phil records on his own. So whatever he's got from me, he's got from me. I, uh, do you remember last time we recorded, you were really ill? I wasn't ill. I had been out all night, and I thought I almost really died. Ill. You were, you were going to cancel. You didn't want to do it. I had to beat you around the head to make you... I know you told me I look like shit. <laughs> yeah, I did, because you did look like shit. Well, it's my turn, because I'm fucking ill today. Did you drink too much yesterday? No, no, I had the shits all day yesterday. And uh, we recorded our podcast last night, and I was sweating like mad. And I was going, is it me, or is it hot in here? Is it hot in here? And the, the other two were like, no, it's not hot. And I had, like, massive pit stains in my armpits and back was wet through maybe you're fighting a flu or something oh well, yeah i think yeah i am yeah i had the worst night's sleep you know when it's just you're just hot and sticky and you, the sheets are wet through and you can't get comfortable and uh yeah headache and now i've got a sore throat as well so i've got i've probably got the new thing the new thing's bird flu isn't it can we let's not let's oh, just got that. i need to talk to you about last night that's what i need to talk to you about yeah. Do you just want to piss off YouTube? Is that your purpose? Oh, do you mean last night's episode? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, no, oh, no. No, no, no. Some other... Yes, of course, last night's episode. You know you can't talk about that stuff on YouTube. Well, we did. I know you did, and you're going to get a flag from that. Well, we'll see. I'm pushing the envelope. We have been doing for ages. It's, it's, so, I saw it pop up. I was like, he didn't talk about that, did he? I was like, you can't even talk about Bill Gates. Why would you think that's safe? Are you putting this on YouTube? I can, I'd can. i like to, but if you want to just do a Spotify only, it's fine. Don't talk about what we talked about last night, then, eh? Yeah, yeah, don't. I'm not going to. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm willing to push the boundaries. We've got a clean bill of health on our channel with no warnings, no strikes or anything. We had to do the training. Have you done the training? Yeah, they offer that up now because I think their algorithm accidentally flags too much stuff. So they're like, hey, let's just run you through. It made me feel like I was in driver's ed. Right, yeah. You get what there's like um like a traffic light system where you get like a warning and well, then maybe you get a, a they, strike or whatnot. They change their rules to where they can update the certain regulations they have for YouTube, but then they can re flag you for something new that they thought of. So like if they randomly said you can't cough in podcasts and then they made that a rule, they would just find it their algorithm would find it in your previous episodes where you've coughed and then they would flag you for it so it's like not really fair but whatever the video's still up it's been demonetized but most of our videos get demonetized anyway uh just because of the con the subject matter we talk about in general but uh and bad language they don't like a lot of cussing on youtube the advertisers you can still do that it just limits the sponsorship yeah see it's limited limited revenue but uh yeah i'm we're pushing it we'll see what happens i reckon it'll stay up I reckon it'll stay up. Okay. It was really graphic. It was too much for me. It was too dark. And, you know, I didn't really, I can't say I enjoyed it. You know, most of our episodes are quite enjoyable and interesting, thought provoking, more, more that sort of thing. Whereas this was like hardcore evil shit that was being talked about. And it was like, God, it was, it was exhausting. Plus I was fucking ill, which didn't help, but you know, We'll see. I reckon it'll still be up this time next week. I'll let you know if they take it down, but I think it'll still be up. I uh, Do you not I, think they're getting easier? Do you not think they're slacking in off a bit, YouTube, with what no. they'll allow? Do you not? I think they're pushing down a little bit harder on certain things, um, but I think it's overall that they're probably phasing out normal, normal human employees, and then they're... Like, if you go to your YouTube app and then you just hit, um, like, refresh on your YouTube studio app on your phone if you have one. It'll show you when somebody reports an episode because it'll say where the views are and the thumbs up and the thumbs down. It'll have subtraction signs there. And then you just refresh it and the views will come back and everything will come back. It looks like it's like a glitch on the app. But it's it's them showing you that it's somebody flagged it so they're going over it. Is that are you on iPhone? Yeah. Oh, I don't think I have that. I'm on Android. I, I've not, I don't recognize. You should. It's just YouTube Studio. Is what it's called. Yeah, that's what I use. I use that app, but I don't. I don't recognize that. That mechanism you described. Then. Well, it's when you go to the content t tab on your phone, and you hit refresh on it. Some of the episodes might have a dash 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 instead of views and all that, and then you refresh it again. And it comes back. It's like a glitch, but it's just showing you that someone had reported it. 
Really? I yeah. think I've seen that now, now you come to mention it. I don't spend a lot of time on it, to be honest. I try and start not to spend too much time on my phone in general. That's what we say, but then we're on it all day long. Yeah. I, don't, I use it a lot for listening to stuff. I like, uh, I'll listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm at work and when I'm walking the dog and things like that. And I use it to watch, I watch a lot of YouTube stuff on, uh, on my phone, which probably isn't ideal. It's probably not good for your eyes, is it? Squinting at a tiny screen all the time. I say all the time, I probably only watch an odd video each day. In the evenings, when my eyes are getting tired, and I'm ready for Bobo's, Borsh's time. What do you watch on YouTube? Just reaction videos? <laughs> it's just cats, yeah. Cats and cucumbers. No, um, I'll tell you what, the last thing I watched was uh, Unheard. Have you seen the Unheard channel? Mm -mm. No, it's like a, a UK-based um, heterodox political politics channel. So they're like, they talk about politics, but they're not, they're not like, uh, what would you call it? They're not like these tribal nut jobs that usually talk about politics on the internet. You mean the ones that have like a severe bias in one thing? <sighs> well, I suppose we all have biases, but... I don't know. I saw Anderson Cooper interview Kamala after those debates. Oh, yeah. I, first time I have ever, ever thought he would be like that on there. Did you watch it? I saw a few clips of the debates. No, I'm talking about the interview with Anderson Cooper. I saw a bit of her reaction where she was saying, did she say it was a slow start or something? Yeah, she said it was a slow start, but Anderson Cooper like, kept saying throughout the whole like 30 minutes or so, was like, do you still think Biden should run? Like, that was awful, really bad. And she was like, don't compare the past like 11 years of him being in whatever to, to uh, the 30 minute or a couple hour debate that he had. You know, let's look at the past track record. And he was like, I'm asking you a question. Do you think after that, that he was doing okay. And then okay, everybody, I think Rob Reiner cried at a party when he saw that Biden. <laughs> he, they all did that. Remember they did that during the, uh, whatever, they lived, they lived the uh, debate versus Trump and Hillary. And they that, I forgot what network it was, but they were all on air talking about Trump's going down. And at the end of it, they were all crying, literally crying tears because Trump was going to win. And I was like, oh, it was live and they couldn't take it down. I mean, they ended up taking it down, but they didn't. It's just funny to watch. Like what? It just made me laugh how how that debate managed to turn everything on its head because we've been playing clips of Uncle Corn Pop for years and years of him tripping over his words and talking gibberish and obviously losing his marbles. And it's it's come to this point, like for, what are we four months out? For what are we in? July. Yeah. A few months ahead of the election, and now they're deciding that maybe he isn't fit for the job. It's like, fucking hell, where have you been for the last four years? It's, it's been obvious, hasn't it? Well, it has been. It seemed obvious to us. But the thing is, you had, like, the, the left-wing press um, playing cover for him, saying, you know, oh, this, this is a conspiracy, that. It, Trump's the one who's got Alzheimer's, not Biden. He's, he's perfectly fine. It's a conspiracy theory. And it's just like, oh, grief. It's like we're living... It's like there's two dimensions of reality happening simultaneously. And some of us live in dimension A and some of us live in dimension B. It's like the, we live in the same reality, but we just see things so differently. It's quite bizarre. Yeah, but how do we get it to where I don't have to worry about other problems that aren't in my universe then? Like, why does gas keep going up? Why, why is everything getting more expensive? It's making it really hard to live for a lot of people. So I'm like, I don't understand how that's affecting me if I don't choose to vote. I don't want to participate in the horse shit. I remind, the same thing you said to me last time, that you didn't want to participate in the nasty shit that the government does. I don't want to do that either. My biggest concern right now is, is that a long time ago, I tried to reach out to those people that freeze people to when they find a cure for something, they can... You know, the, the, the age thing, to make sure you stop aging, you can kind of live forever when they find a cure for your illness. So they'll freeze you in cryogenics. I think it's what it's called. Yeah, demolition man. They had a giant scandal happen where a couple of the tanks that were holding some of these frozen people, they opened it up and it was just ooze. That was one of the guys. <laughs> I was dying, dude. Because I was like, damn, I remember emailing the guy that owned that company and we were going to set something up for him to come on my show. Oh, how do we reanimate this puddle? <laughs> this puddle of human DNA. Can you just imagine you're in heaven and like you're 
talking to God and you're having everything you want, whatever. And then you are, you wake up, you get sucked out of heaven. You wake up and your head's being attached to like a, like another body. Hey, you can't move your arms and legs, but at least you're alive. Right. And you're like, Oh no, no. <laughs> Let me go back, please. Oh my God. <laughs> and you have to live forever now. Cause you're like a digital consciousness. You've no way back. But that's what everyone's pushing for. In my opinion, like, I don't even want to talk about modern politics. I just want to, like, the weird kind of what things would be called fringe. If you would have mentioned 10 years ago that people were freezing themselves, trying to make sure that they can be thought out in the future and exist in a different time period, is that any different than what's been going on throughout all of history when we talk about this quest for immortality? Uh, mum mummification. Yeah. Could you argue that the ancient Egyptians were trying to do the same thing? But weren't they already dead? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it was it was kind of, it was it was more preparing them for the journey, wasn't it, to the afterlife? So it it wasn't to sort of bring them back in this realm, but to help them onto the next thing because they believed in the after in an afterlife, whereas the guys today who get turned into goo <laughs> in an ice box. <laughs> They too get turned into ice. I died, bodies. Phil. Stop <laughs> laughing. <laughs> they obviously don't believe in an afterlife. That's why they're doing it in the first place. So I think the motivation's the same. It's like, um, yeah, the ancient Egyptians. The motivation was eternal life, wasn't it? They got mummified and and uh, in pre preparedness for the eternal here hereafter. Whereas the icebox goo people are getting. <laughs> prepared for returning to this life for eternal life it's the same motivation we're all terrified of death a lot of us but i think that's propaganda i think it's because they f make you fear so much of what death is going to be like and most depictions of death is pretty painful i think it's relatively new ideas of thinking that it's like okay to like sometimes it's peaceful you know what i mean but that's only like for instance like why did we still ban euthanasia all these people that are dying of like a severe illness and they're like, we'll make you comfortable. It's like, why don't you just, if they want to sign up for it and they don't want to be around anymore, then do it. And they're like, no, 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 that would be suicide and that would be bad. And then this, it's like, they got, you're giving them like three days to live. You know, they're not feeling so good. There's plenty of old people that just want to fade out. I remember my great, my grandma before she died, she was like, I'm not leaving my home. I'm going to die in my home. And then, you know, she did. There's, there's a couple of different there's a slight um some some slight differences between those things so so you can mix those things up euthanasia and palli palliative care so like you mentioned someone with three days to live and we we have different care pathways i think they're called in the uk where they make you comfortable essentially and they'll give you painkillers and and such and that sort of, I think that would be called something like ease, e easing the transition. So you're going to die very soon. So they make you as comfortable as possible. Whereas euthanasia, I think that's more, it's more proactive and it's more, um, what's the word? For example, uh, is it in, is it in Canada where they're bringing in euthanasia for mental illnesses? I might be completely making what? this up. Wait, so if you have schizophrenia, they're like, hey, real quick. You can, you can kill yourself. You no, can euthanize. No wonder they're severely paranoid because everyone fucking is afraid of them. Yeah, but I mean, so this is where it gets dicey. It's like, where do you draw draw the line on it? And also, you have to be very careful when you when you bring in laws that are that are saying that that are saying euthanasia is okay, um, because things can be exploited and loopholes can be exploited. Imagine if there's like um, some, some wealthy old lady and, and you know, she's physically fine and everything, but she's maybe, maybe starting with dementia slightly. And, you know, she's got a nasty niece who stands to inherit all of her fortune. And, you know, she can maybe, you know, coerce her into euthanasia or you know the, you'd have to have a lot of safeguards in place to protect vulnerable people i guess well i think there's ways to stop like dementia and the alzheimer's process but that is one where like a lot of people are like i just don't want to live if i know that i'm slowly going to forget everyone in my brain is just going to deteriorate but then i'm like we all see biden right like 
they're pump they pump something they might have pumped them up a little too much but we're seeing the ramifications of it like what is it that drug off the boys where they gives you superpowers v is what do they call it and if you take it for too long your brain starts turning to goo <laughs> and so like they're they, they're really powerful and really strong in the beginning when they're first starting to take in the dosages and then after a while they start to become weak and they can't even live anymore they end up just dying that was biden they've been pumping them with all this stuff and they extra up during the debate and it was too much you saw it crack a little bit is that what's happening do you think he's being jacked up i there's got to be something there's moments where he was like on his shit where i was like you either took a nap you either ate some ice cream you did something that really sparked up you know yourself a little bit because I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I'm trying not to get involved. I mean, I will because it's um, it's the orange man again. That'll be entertaining. So I'll probably follow some of the politics over there. But we had an election on Thursday, just gone, and I didn't bother voting. I, I just don't pay any attention to it. I just let them, let them get on with their own thing. As long as they leave me alone, I'm not really bothered. And we just got this boring guy in. Uh, he's an ex. He's a lawyer, and. People just see him as like a safe pair of hands and, it'll, it, you know, it'll be stability. I think that was his, his slogan, his, his campaign slogan was, was it stability? Oh, my gosh, I heard it the other day. Change from stability or something it was called, his slogan. It's just really mediocre and bland and inoffensive. What does that mean? Oh, uh, it's like, yeah. He's so he's so stable that we'll we'll, we'll change things by being really stable. I mean, it's just not inspiring to anyone at all. Think but... about a house with four walls. Imagine a house with six. That's how stable we're going to be. Yeah, yeah. We'll put some extra walls in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I've no time for him. I just ugh, it bores me. It's so tribal and uh, divisive politics, and you just can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's all over the internet, it's all over YouTube, social media, all over your newspapers. But is that our algorithms or is that? No, I think it's speak? everywhere. I don't think people, like a lot of people do care, I do believe about politics, but a lot of people like you normally don't really talk about it. I used to, I used to be into politics, but you know, you get to a point where you just think, ah, oh, they're all the same. I'm not wasting any more time and energy on it. Move on, something new, do something interesting instead. How about laws governing not putting people in popsicle tanks? I think maybe if that's Why what you... Why would you sign up for that? I don't get it. If that's what you want to do, you should be free to do it. It's your own body. No, I agreed, agreed. It's just to me, it's like I don't... The family's suing the corporation right now. Are they? Yeah, and I'm like, that's, that's your fault. That's your fault. I mean, surely there must be some mad disclaimer you've got to sign before you get put in. I'm into sure there's a full, full contract. But to be honest, it'd be a good mechanism to get rid of some of the elite wasps out there by just having them sign up and just forget to pay the light bill or some shit. And next thing you know. It's a bit like that guy. We, did, we covered a story a week or two ago about that guy who's trying to cheat death. And he's, he's the guy who's been harvesting his son's blood. Have you heard that guy's American? Is that the clip you just played earlier? Uh, no. Before we started, that was, about, that was about head shrinkers. No, it's a guy. I can't remember his name. He's like a tech tech billionaire. And the last thing he did uh, a week or two ago is he went to Honduras to get gene therapy to try and make him live forever. <laughs> did it work? No, it won't work. But he's, he'll try anything. He's just terrified. I just, oh, I don't know. It's you, a fear of death. It, that's what it all comes back to. It's yeah, like, sad. like I said, I think it's the propaganda aspect, but I think it's a lot of people want to get either to the end already, like make sure they can skip right to like the where they go if they're religious. And then there are people that are afraid of it because it is scary. But like you don't, you're only afraid of like when it's going to happen. You're not afraid of when it does happen. It's the, it's the final frontier. It's the last great mystery, the last great adventure. No one really knows. People say they know, but no one really knows what happens when it happens, do they? I mean, you know, you've had um, near-death experiences on your show, haven't you, Robbie? Yeah, but you told me they weren't. You told me they were just like close encounters. Oh, well, there's different Like I was things. fighting a shark in the sea or something. 
There's different grades, isn't there? There's different gradients of near-death experiences. Yes, being shot in the head is different than actually being close to getting shot in the head. <laughs> A near miss, yeah. But if you, when you talk to those people who've been brought back... That's what you called them. You called them near misses. Near misses, yeah. I mean, it's hard to... Uh, it's hard to argue. I mean, people say, well, it's just... you you brain just gets flooded with all sorts of chemicals to ease the transition of death and it's all hallucination it's all in your mind or whatever yeah maybe do you believe those near-death experiences because i don't <laughs> i believe the real what the people are saying are real yeah right. but it's like an acid the... trip your brain goes through. i don't think they actually saw heaven and they got to do all that i don't believe that it's like that one woman that was trying to trick people that she was related to a bunch of royalty in her past life that she was like, I know all about my past lives and I was once Cleopatra in a past life. And then next thing I know, I was Adolf Hitler. And it's like, what the fuck? I don't believe a single word this woman's saying. Oh, well, no, I believe that they believe what they're seeing. So what they're seeing in general, obviously, there are Fruit Loops everywhere who will just make shit up for attention. They're, they're, those people are everywhere. But I mean, one of the guys we had on uh, who had a near-death experience, I totally believed his story. He was, he was an, an honest guy, and it was a good, uh, you know, it was nothing out of the ordinary. It was just like a, a life review. He had like the classic, your life uh, going back in time, back to birth, the classic near-death experience, and he was telling the truth. Definitely, there's no reason to lie. No reason to lie. So that that experience happened to him. Now, whether that is something mystical and spiritual, or whether it's just an accident of brain chemistry, I don't know. But it's an interesting thing to ponder, isn't it? Whether it's re real or not, truly real or not, or whether when we die, you know, it's just fade to black and that's it. Your existence ends. Or the theory that the bright white light is the hospital lights and you're being born again. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah. Eternal recurrence. I don't know where I stand on reincarnation. I don't know. It's kind of it's kind of a comforting thing to believe, isn't it? That you get to have a, a go around in different places, different times. It's okay if you get like a bump up in your tax status. You know what I mean? Like if like you're born into a rich family and you're not just some like people go like, you'll be born as a dung beetle. I'm like, yeah, what kind of That'd be sweet, wouldn't it? Is that? You get reborn as some sort of slush fund kid, trust you're fund kid. Born as a house fly, you're born, then you're dead a second later. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I kind of don't believe, I don't, I'm, I'm probably, if you pushed me, I would probably say, no, I don't believe in reincarnation. But again, you have to use the word belief because none of us really know. It's all just hunches, really. So I try not to be do too definitive either way on these sorts of questions because my view is well i don't know and anyone who does tell who, do, who does tell you they know they're, they're probably full of it because how can they know it's a good point yeah you think we would have technology to be able to like kill somebody and then bring them back to life real quick do you remember do you ever see the movie flatliners can you imagine that just a Killing somebody, or not not saying you do it, but they have a technology that puts you, like, makes you dead for, like, at least a minute, and they bring you back, and then you come back, and you're like, hey, how was it? Was it great? Was it great? You're like, oh, my God, it was horrible. There were rings of fire everywhere, and he's just, he's just going off, and you're just like, oh, shit, he went to hell. What was his background? Armed robbery. Jesus. P pick somebody like a Christian person. <laughs> Yeah, I've not seen it for donkey's years. So was, that, um, was it Denzel Washington? I think it was Denzel Washington, Julia Roberts, and Keith Sutherland were in uh, Flatliners, where that's what they did. They used, uh, were they doctors? Was it a group of doctors? And they started experimenting with killing, killing each other and bringing them back to life, bringing themselves back to life for uh, NDEs. Sounds like something you do when you're drinking with your buddies and someone has a defib unit. Yeah. Hey, we have them everywhere now. Have you, are they popping up in the U.S. everywhere? What, like every street corner has defibrillators, yeah. Have you ever used one before? No, fortunately, I've never had to use one, no. It's surprisingly complicated. Is it? Especially the mobile ones, because they have a certain number of charge to it. So, like, if you don't get it upticked, or if you, like, we had a person die at my gym one time. And oh, my be, God. be brought back. And um, 
they used to grab the defib unit and they ran over to him to defib him and it didn't work because it was out of charge. It was out of warranty for the thing. It's like every two years you have to get a new one. And I'm like, man, it's like your fire extinguisher. A bunch of people have them under their sinks, but you know, like I, the best advice I'd ever gotten from my grandfather was make sure you're friends with people in the fire department. Cause when, you know, your house comes up on their list, they're coming to you, buddy. And I'm like, all right. So I just made friends with every single fire department. Like those kids that are in school for it, that are going to be one when they get older, that's what they want to do. So now I know all of the fire department. So did that guy not make it then at the gym? No, he made it. He got brought back. <sighs> Gosh. Right. Yeah. His name's Frank. I see him every morning. It's funny because you see the back of his truck and there's just Trump stickers all over the back of it. And you go, I go, I know for a fact the woman that gave him mouth to mouth who was a nurse at the gym. I go, I know she's a Biden supporter. I know afterwards she saw that truck and she was like, God, why did I? Why did I bother? <laughs> Gosh, so did you have to use the machine or were you watching someone else use it? No, I grabbed it and I went over to it to start it up and then it wasn't turning on and I realized it was out of charge. And then someone an actual nurse ran over and started doing CPR and stuff like that, which I could have done, but they don't recommend you don't have to do the mouth thing anymore. No, I believe not. No. Uh, yeah. It's just chest compressions now, isn't it? Apparently. Yeah. Which I'm just like, what, what, who, who thought the mouth thing then? Was it just one guy like with a really hot chick that was like, <laughs> Hey, it worked. <laughs> How did you know to blow in her mouth? Uh, uh, blow don't suck. <laughs> oh dear well i didn't think we'd be talking about cpr today robbie we're going to talk about a lot of things but first you should probably tell people about your show because we were supposed to do that in the beginning we didn't do it oh it's and we don't have to Why? Just, got to just um what you do put a link or something in the description i know but usually people like to go to give a breakdown of what you're interested in learning about oh uh, um weird shit that's like i like weird shit i like uh ancient history I like um, esoteric subjects. What's esoteric mean? Well, I think the, the original meaning is sort of hidden. Oh, no, that's occult. Uh, so there's eso and exoteric. So, yeah, exoteric would be like things that are in plain sight in the mainstream, if you like. And esoteric would be things that are sort of behind, you have to sort of dig through. So... So something can have an exoteric meaning and an esoteric meaning, and maybe you have to dig a bit deeper for the esoteric meaning of certain things. But things like, uh, it's a very broad term, esotericism, but things that fall into it would be things like um, tarot, the tarot cards, and the symbology therein. Um, I just did a couple episodes on that. I'm really interested in the psychic stuff. Because I think everyone has a belief in it, but like, also, I think a lot of that is because, man, this is why I'm like, I like to think of myself as a coast to coast type of show, you know, that has a little bit of everything, but it's specifically the Art Bell programs where it's where he's interviewing people. And then like, there's an hour break where it's Madam Cleo with the bell, where she'll talk about giving you your fortune. If you call into the psychic hotlines, like there was a whole period in like the eighties and nineties where it was talk radio and people coming on and like interviewing alien people. And, you know, there's always been this fascination of wanting to hear what these people have experienced. Even if you don't really believe it, we all have a small bit of belief, whether it's Bigfoot, whether it's whatever you want to say. So I'm always interested in learning about how those subjects have influenced our culture. Cause you can't really say it's like stupid to learn about that shit because in some people's minds, religion is really stupid to learn about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Carl Jung, would be one of these guys who sort of bridges the gap. So he was, uh, was he a psychoanalyst? He was a famous psych, uh, psychologist. Was he, um, not Swiss. Was he Swiss? Carl Jung? Can't remember. But, um, he was like a, a famous psychoanalyst, but he also delved into the esoteric realm. So he did a lot of, um, one of his major areas of work was called the archetypes. And it's about these sort of universal archetypes in people's psyche that are on display in various, various parts. And he talks a lot about the subconscious and uh, it's quite mystical when you think about it, the subconscious. It's like, um, there's a, there's a very thin line, dividing line between something being someone being psychic and someone just accessing something from their subconscious. If you ever watch uh, that guy, Darren Brown, he's another guy who sort of um, treads that 
path walks that tightrope where he'll show how people can be influenced subconsciously. He'll set people up on his TV show and, and, and it'll end with a trick, a, a sort of a magic trick, essentially. He'll do it like a mind reading magic trick at the start of the show. And then he'll wind the tape back to the beginning and they'll have a secret camera following this lady, say, who he asked, who he demonstrated this psychic ability to. And this, this camera follows this lady around all day. And all through her day, she's been given little cues, little subconscious cues here and there. Something flashes on a billboard on the street corner. Someone, uh, a lady with a pram says something, a certain phrase, just as, he's, as she's walking past her. And it's all building towards this seemingly show of psychic prowess at the, at the, at the end of it all. But it's just how our psych, uh, subconscious works and operates. It's very, it's quite mysterious and probably not very well understood. But, uh, you know, things like advertisement. Yeah, but I'll say they, they do that for advertising. If you ever looked up how they, um, they did a study a while ago about the Facebook like button and then the angry face and the smiley face saying that you would get more people that would react to stuff if they added a thing like a like button or they added a smiley face or a happy face and angry face. You get more interaction with that post. Well, with advertising, they hired a bunch of psychologists to try and develop marketing. It's called manipulative marketing. And it's when they're really trying to implant stuff. Like, for instance, if most of the world is suffering from depression or some type of mental disorder, when we talk about the light stuff, anxiety and things like that, which can be severe, but I'm talking about compared to schizophrenia, I would call that light shit. Um, you know, it's different when you think everyone around you is fucking, you know, there. And the next thing you know, you're just talking to yourself because you're just insane. Um, that's instead of that commercial, there's that commercial that for the schizophrenic medication. Where it's a woman, she's sitting at a coffee restaurant and she's all upset and she's holding her arms like this and she's just like, it looks like she's suffering with depression. And it says like schizophrenia, you know, it's hard to enjoy the moments when you're around people that you love and it's like all this type of stuff. And there's a whole bunch of people laughing and smiling around her and she's just miserable. And then um, they introduce this medication and she takes it. And then um, she's sitting at the coffee shop by herself and she's smiling and drinking a cup of coffee. Those people weren't fucking there. They were an illusion in her mind. But that's now she's what, happy. That's wild because, you know, we're not allowed any uh, advertising. Yeah, for the United product. States is one of two countries in the world that does it. It's us and it's um, New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. But the, yeah. if you see a commercial for someone that is depressed and or let's take acne, for instance. If you see a commercial with a teenager with a lot of acne, he's getting made fun of in school and stuff like that. His face looks like he's been cooking pizza on it. You, what happens is they introduce this cream, show you, you can use this, and the next thing you know, and the kid's smiling, he's dating the hottest girl in school, and then he's walking out the door. Everyone's going to buy that if they have acne. So it's like it's marketing. You're targeting an audience that's already at a weak demographic because of the fact that they feel self-conscious about their looks, and now you're giving them something, which in the long run might end up doing more damage to them than good. Some of the side effects, especially with that one, that one made you explosive diarrhea and then bleeding from your eyes was one of them yes shit you know oh my gosh there must be some good natural remedies for things like acne i would always be like inclined to look for natural things i mean i'm not a doctor and definitely don't take med medical advice from me or this podcast but if i had a medical condition the first thing i would look is you know there must be like an old school remedy for this kind of thing or at least something you could try before messing around with like weapons grade pharmaceuticals. Yeah, it's like per testosterone booster. I think it's instead of taking like the prescribed stuff, you can just use horny goat weed, um, which is a natural herb supplement. Um, and they sell it in stores for like five bucks, but it's the same thing that's included in all or most testosterone boosters. Wow. Yeah. A lot of older guys seem to be doing this now, don't they? Testosterone. Did I work at a gym, man? You telling me it's so natural to, for me now. I either see steroids or I see something else where I'm just like, okay, it's so normal now. There's a guy who came into my gym and he's got to be maybe late forties, early fifties. And he was wearing a tank top, dude. His arms look like, like the most ripped I've ever seen where I was like, he's on something for sure. I go in the bathroom and I see giant pill bottles, like huge ones. And I go, that's testosterone therapy. That is... I'm going to say that's a type of steroid. 
Um, and then when I was making him a protein shake, he was like, yeah, man. He's like, I wish I could be like, you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape. I wish I could have like the, the, the muscularness and all that type of shit. And I was like, yeah, you're on something though. Like it's how you got to where you're at. And he was like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, don't need to lie to me. I don't care. Nobody does. It's so normal now. Like, I don't know how many friends I know now that in the past year have gotten breast implants. Like it was just a normal thing to start getting boob implants before it was so taboo to talk about changing yourself in so way. And then like, it's just normal. We're in a society now where it's like, we, if you have the money to do it and people are going to do it, they don't care. Yeah, I know. Cause I, well, from what I've heard, once you hit about 40, your natural testosterone production starts to slow down. Yeah, but I'm taking some and I'm in my, I'm 26. Right. Is, is there not, a, is there not a, a case that if you start supplementing, then you can sort of switch off your body's own production and then you become reliant on it? They do recommend cycling, but you have to be careful because a lot of people, what they're doing is like how they do it with steroids, where they take it and then there's, it's irreversible damage. It's like hormone therapy stuff, not to get into that whole realm and that shit <laughs> sounds like being attacked. But um, it's you. You can't. That there's some things you can't take and then it not have a permanent effect to you. It's kind of like smoking a cigarette for the first time. You can't undo the taste or the smell of that cigarette. It just doesn't happen. It's like what uh, Tim Ferriss said famously in one of his books. There's no biological free lunch. Bingo. Everything. Everything has like a you know a payoff and a cost. So, uh, yeah, I don't really, I've don't, I've never taken any of those things like steroids or testosterone. I, t I take vitamin D though. <laughs> you can find it now? Vitamin D? Yeah, for a while you couldn't find it because people bought it all. Really? Oh, no, there's never been a problem over here. No. I was just like, go outside, God. That's all you have to do. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't work it where we are. Not for uh, like six months of the year. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You're, yeah. See, that's where we should have been sending it to. All our supplies should have gone to you guys over there because you guys really need it. We had a vitamin D expert on back in 2021. Uh, Dr. David Grimes is called. And he, he was a, he's retired now, but he was a gastro and, and what did he say? how did he say it? Gastrologist. Enterologist. 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 Yeah. Something like that. Guts, gut doctor. They're called thing. a GI. GI. That's it. Yeah, he was a consultant, I think, one of those. But his big thing was vitamin D. And going through all the nonsense back in 2020 and 21, he was sort of analysing the evidence for vitamin D and what it may and may not be able to do. And one of the things he explained to us is because we're up in the north of England, when it gets to, I think it's from round about September to March, that time of the year, even though the sun's out, because it's so low in the sky, for some reason, the, the rays, they, they don't have the power to get through the atmosphere and, and make you produce much vitamin D. So you're pretty much using your reserves up all the way through the autumn and winter. So he said, you know, at the, at the, at the minimum, you should be supplementing throughout autumn and winter. And, and if, you know, the thing is, a lot of us work at home now or in an office. We don't get as much outdoor um time as maybe we did a hundred years ago well certainly not a hundred years ago we're either in an office in, at home or in a car going between the office and home uh, we don't get much exercise so i thought it, it was seemed like a no-brainer to me i'll start taking it so i started taking it well what would that be about three years ago started taking vitamin d i've been taking it ever since well it's, i think I, it's I was all... gonna say I've, I've hardly ever been ill but <laughs> i'm actually ill now it's it's either all or most of the population has a vitamin D deficiency. That's what he said. Uh, uh, many, yeah, a big big chunk are would be classed as vitamin D deficient. And the other issue we have uh, in the UK, um, if you're if you have darker skin, so if you're from African or Indian, yeah, more melanin. Yeah, the the melanin acts acts almost like a sunblock. So the more melanin you have in your skin, I think the less production uh, vitamin D you get. Um, so people with high melanin uh, skin tone living in the northern latitudes like us, they're like it's like a double whammy. So they really should be taking vitamin D like more than anyone. But like, nah, no one wanted to know. No one was telling. It was like basic advice they could have given us a few years ago and. 
it got poo pooed and never went anywhere. But yeah, at the end of the day, you just got to do what's in your own best interest and do your do your own research. That's the, that's the term, isn't it? I had a researcher on about selling psychic services, and I'm supposed to have him back on again to talk about another thing you wrote about selling alternative medicines. I mean, you can't say that they don't do something. It's like trying to just say that there's no psychic abilities. You can have the belief of that, but it's just it's not. There's got to be something else. There's a lot of things that our bodies and minds can do that are just unexplainable. We still can't label a term for consciousness. We can't do a bunch of things. And it's not shaming anybody for just not having it figured out. It's just there's a lot of things that we just don't know. And that's what I like about like, you know, you're into the ancient history, the kind of the older stuff, the esoteric stuff. Our whole bodies and minds are esoteric. We don't fully understand them. Usually it's like new information comes out 10 years later and it completely debunks what we've been going off of for so long. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I'm really interested in um, not the belief, but like what the damage is being done future wise when it comes to our minds and how we're so involved and entrapped in devices and everything's like that because it goes by so quick it's like working at a job for however long next thing you know if you're just working so many hours a day you're just going home and sleeping and going back to work it's like a year passes it's quite scary isn't it I, because I, I said on our podcast only a couple of years ago oh no not a couple of years ago it was another podcast i was on a sheep farm podcast sheepfarm.co.uk a couple of friends of ours who do a podcast and uh, I was saying like I think life was better before smartphones I remember what life was like before the iPhone came out and life was better people were more social people used to interact more um, I, I, don't, I don't think for all the convenience that they've brought I don't think they've actually improved our lives and it's more, I wouldn't say it's the psychological aspect that concerns me as much as you as the social thing. I just think we're probably less social than we used to be. I think. And, uh, but kids are quite resilient, though. You know, people, kids can be brought up on tablets and on smartphones. And I think they can pretty much snap out of it and get out of it. I think they can bounce back. It's the adults. <laughs> it's the adults that I'm more worried about. People get so insular, don't they? And they just, it, it's an addiction. That's the issue yeah. I have. Is the, the screens become addictive and that's, and again, you were talking about the uh, Facebook advertising agency, agencies being brought in, the psychologists being brought into Facebook. We, we know why. The, the eyes, they just want eyeballs, eyeballs, eyeballs. Give me eyeballs on the screen. That's how we sell advertising. And so it's, it's uh, difficult for adults. It requires a lot of discipline to be able to put the screen down. And uh, unfortunately, we're lacking a lot of discipline. And I'm no saint. I'm as bad as anyone else. I would have agreed with you. At least I've recognized the problem. I would have agreed with you, but I disagree because I think we're just, I don't know how many times, like we have this device that can access the internet. So you can basically be fact checked on fucking anything. Um, But surprisingly someone comments what about this and it's like you have your phone google it what the fuck like i i I can't imagine someone from like 13th century in a time machine viewing us thinking oh my god they have these devices that have access to the internet they must be the smartest beings in the human history and then they go to you and they, he's jacking his dick to mariah carey again it's the 14th <laughs> time today you know like it's just something to me where i'm like i don't think and I think technology, like the problem has been fixed, which is overall now we have guidelines and placement and a lot of people are doing the proactive measure, whether it's a parent or whether it's a person themselves. Like for me, I can be sucked up in my phone all day when I'm bored and it's just right there and it's really easy to do. Or I'll go, I'm not touching my phone and I'm going to go out and explore. But then I end up getting in trouble when I don't touch my phone for eight hours and I have like 30 missed calls and 20 something missed text messages. And then I'm getting messages off my Instagram or something like that. Like, why won't you talk to me? And I'm like, God damn, I was trying to enjoy a concert, have a couple pina coladas. Yeah. I don't get bothered with text messages. I find uh, when I was younger, texting was the Be thing. in your 20s. And then, you know. Yeah. So that's what probably what I'm going back to. When I was in my early 20s, uh, yeah, texting back and forth was a major thing. Everyone used to text, and you would get, I don't know, dozens of texts a day, maybe. Whereas now, it tends to be group chats. So you'll have, 
Instead of having, you know, uh, 50 people sending you text messages, you'll just be in a, a few groups, a couple of groups where you, you message, you know, collectively. But I think that's part of getting older as well. Your life um, gets more complicated and, and most of the messages I ask, I, I receive are from school now. <laughs> I get more messages from frigging school than I do from any of my friends. What, comes to your kids? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the schools, because, like, you're talking about technology, like, schools have their own apps now, and you have to log into your school's app where you get messages regarding your children. Oh, about the um, the trip to Blackpool that's coming up next week. Here's the form. Here's the form for the day trip to France that you need to sign. Here's a message about non-uniform day on Friday the 31st of July. Here's a message about um, uh, the leavers do. Here's a message about the careers evening at Preston College next Wednesday. Dude, I would lose my shit if I got that many emails off of something like that. I always am so hesitant on websites to put that info in there because I know they're going to fucking spam me. And the next thing you know, I do one thing. I put in my email. I get six emails in a row and I go unsubscribe. Never email me. Never. The thing is, it's not spam. This is all stuff you have to respond to. So it's every day. You get messages every day from school. And I've got two. So two different schools, because one's at high school and one's at primary school. It's mad. I would I would immediately quit. Like, when I was a kid. Homeschool. It, well, I'd love to if I had the money, but I can't afford to do that. But um, when I was a kid, if the school needed to send a message, they would send a letter home with the child. And it would be very occasionally... A couple of, you know, or they'd send a newsletter out at the end of every week with all the information on for that week. Whereas now, because it's so easy for them to just type a message and send it through the app, you get it every day, message after message after message. It's fucking bonkers. Yeah, but I like it. You can pay bills online compared to getting it in the mail because <laughs> that is difficult because whenever I my mailbox is not in front of my house, it's down the street. And the only time I ever go past is when I'm going to something or I'm coming back from something. So I'm either focused on getting there and we'll get it on the way back. Or then when I'm on the way back, I'm too tired to go check the mailbox. So the next thing I know, I get a car payment that's like it's due tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, okay. So this is easier to do on my phone. Yeah. Yeah. It swings and roundabouts, isn't there? I would think the mail service would have been gone by now with all the, everything being online, but. Well, it's all deliveries, isn't it? I think deliveries are taking over rather than sort of mail, like a letter, letter mail, postage mail. You know, it's all delivery stuff, isn't it? Amazon and uh, all these food companies, Deliveroo and Uber Eats and all this mad shit. The way, why don't, why don't, I just don't get it. Well, I do get it. It's, it's takeaway, isn't it? It's pizza delivery, but it's everything now. Everything's to your door. It's kind of like idiocracy. Yeah, but that's just accessibility. I mean, if you have the option not to leave your home and put on pants, then you're going to take that option. Most people are. That's you call it sad. lazy, but it's like, that means to be sad. honest. It's a sad indictment of where we're at, Robbie. It's better than me having a couple of drinks thinking I can drive, and then <laughs> it's just down the street. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of car do you have, Robbie? I have a Honda Accord. Oh, Honda Accord. Is 1994, that a... older than me. Oh, nice. Is that petrol? No, it's just regular gas. That's his petrol, isn't it? No. No, is it not? Ethanol. I just got to pour moonshine and it starts to go. We have, we, over here, we have diesel and petrol cars. I just it's it says regular when I hit it. That's all. I, I bet it'll be petrol. It'll be petrol. We just have different names for the same thing. I think. I literally just spent all day yesterday. Well, actually, it was only like twenty minutes. Went out there and cleaned it up, washed it. You know, uh, gave it oh, the old rub down. You selling it? No, just wanted to make it clean. <laughs> right. I usually have a like everyone has a trash bag. I think in their car they throw trash in to make sure it's. You know, like just not an actual trash bag. It's a plastic bag or something. We just throw some trash in there so you can keep it off the floor and everything like that. But I wanted to vacuum it out. And my car is old, but it has a sunroof. And when it rains, sometimes water comes through. Why, so, why, why are you creating trash in your car? Well, you end up eating something or drinking something in your car and you have an empty bottle and then you just don't throw it out when you get out of the car. Yeah, right. You eat and drink in your car. 
My Just buddy, see. my buddy has had a piss bottle in the back of his car for at least a good couple months. And I remember getting into his car and I was like, what the hell is this? I go, is this your pee? And he goes, yeah, I use it when I'm on my way to work. I go, why don't you throw it out when you're done with it? You know, like you're not using it anymore. We're not going to add more pee onto this. And he's a teacher. And I'm like, you fucking, he drives 45 minutes to his work. So he's late to teach his students. He's just peeing in a bottle in the car. And I go, it makes me think when I was a kid in school and I was in there trying not to act like I was stoned and the teacher would come in. I go, what were they going through that day? They maybe well, there was a horrible divorce or whether it was like they were, you know, just ate a gas station taquito on the roller. You know, like how they had the hot dogs in the little gas stations. Yeah. And then maybe they were right when, sorry, go on. And I was and then they were going into work, you know, pissing in a bottle and hoping Just, to God that they can get home to watch uh, Game of Thrones. Maybe he was waiting to get pulled over by the cops, like in Dumber and Dumber. If he's in that. For what the for what were the P B for? To to give the to the cop. They don't if, uh, I, I know what that. you're talking about, but I just don't understand why. Dumb and uh, Jim Carrey and, and Jeff Brit not it was, Jeff Brit No, it was Harlem Williams was the cop that yeah, drank yeah, 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 yeah. And he drinks it, he goes <laughs> and starts clicking. <laughs> I w I only say that because I watched it about three weeks ago. I've been making my kids watch like uh, classic comedy films from the nineties, eighties and nineties because they watch too much of this modern rubbish that's not funny <laughs> and boring. I had that view too when I was watching cartoons with my nephews and I was like, all right, I'm going to pay the eight ninety nine for boomerang to watch Johnny Bravo. And I turned it on and within two minutes I paused it and I go, I don't think we can watch this. And they were, they were like, what's wrong with it? And I was like, first of all, you guys are way too young to get the jokes. One's five. The other one's three. I was like, you guys are not going to get the jokes. And I don't think these are inter these are not appropriate jokes. So I grabbed his mom and I was like, real quick, can you look at this real quick? And I literally hit play. The girl pushes Johnny Bravo onto a table. The table comes out and grabs like clamps, still clamp his wrists and legs down and spreads his legs apart. And I pause it and I go, what do you think? And she goes, no. And I go, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I wonder. Uh, oh. I wouldn't say kids are more sensitive, but if you definitely think about what you watch as a kid compared to what goes on now, it's a whole different ballpark. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I yeah, but I mean, they I, can find worse stuff on their phone too. So it's like that's what, that's what I was thinking. Like, if if they have unfettered access to the internet, then that's the least of your problems. Unfettered, unfettered access unfettered. to internet. My kids don't as yet. It's like, how long do you try and shield them from that shit? They're gonna have to figure it out some point in their life, aren't they? I guess, you know, my idea is just wait till they're a bit older, when they're maybe 16, something like that, and then just let them have have at it at the internet. But. I think that's what most parents were doing when I was a kid, but then it was, there's a large fear of kids being kidnapped. Like, everyone forgot the trend in, like, the 90s and, like, early – or not early 80s, uh, late 80s, where there was movies about kids being kidnapped and horror stories about kids being kidnapped and – vans and all this type of stuff like when the black phone came out they did a study about that and found out that a lot of people went to go see that movie because they had childhood trauma from being warned about not talking to strangers and this whole movement that was going on when i was a kid growing up wow yeah i remember well i mentioned it last night i remember like we when we were in primary school occasionally we'd have a police officer come into the school to give us a talk about stranger danger and not talking to strangers and all that kind of thing. Ours talked about drugs. Was it? Was it? Oh, it'll be after just say no, won't it? You're, you're younger than that. It was called the Dare program, and yeah, and they uh, it actually put more people on drugs. Um, what, what did it? What did it stand for? That the acronym? Like something drugs uh, regulation against violence or something. It's 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 something. It's there's an acronym for it. It's I don't think it's violence. I think it's like uh something. Was it Barbara Bush or someone who was behind that? Hell if I know, man. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, but I, I just remember the cop thinking. being pulling the short straw to end up doing that. You know, he was hung over walking in there, and being, that's my my whole life is giving people backstories where I don't have to talk to them. I just <laughs> give them like a reason. 
Yeah. I bet it's I bet it's so different school in America compared to over here. I guess. Did you go to like, uh, where did you go to school? You're not going to know what it is. No, I mean, like, was it, um, what did they call it, like a state-run school? I was like, in a public school, for sure. My parents were not putting me in one of those private things. The first time I ever saw a private, actual school person was when I was in my 19 years old. I was sitting at a Starbucks, and a bunch of people came in wearing the same private school outfit. And I was like, that's what the Red Hot Chili Peppers meant by Catholic schoolgirls. <laughs> so did you not have to wear school uniform then hell no see everyone wears school uniforms in the uk i Public. wore like an acdc shirt and i wore uh some surf shirts where i live in a beach town so everything's surf vibe right yeah everyone it's school un uh, pretty much every school in the country has school uniform in the uk doesn't matter who runs it whether it's government or anyone else yeah. Because it's proper. Well, it's sort of getting you, well, I would say, I. you know, you could argue, well, it's sort of getting rid of you, your individualism. It's a uh, uniform. I mean, the word school uniform. So you're, it's, it's encouraging uniformity. You're conforming with the group. You're being part of the machine. You're being groomed to be a good, uh, productive cog in the machine with your uniform so that when you leave school and you go to the factory and put on your factory uniform and they ring the bell in the factory ding, 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 right time to go to work ding, 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 ding. right it's dinner break time now ding, 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 ding. right your shift starts again you know a lot of the things that the school system embraced are sort of mechanisms and grooming tactics to prepare kids for the world of work to make them useful useful to uh, the economy they don't really teach people how to be critical thinkers how to think for themselves how to question authority nothing like that that's not useful for the bosses is it they don't want free thinkers crikey they're dangerous do you not think I think you're just viewing it differently. I kind of view it more as like people that run a business and all they're thinking about is how to make the best profits off their business. And they're like, oh, people like it and it looks more professional when everyone's wearing a uniform. And, you know, people show up on this certain time and work till this certain time. It's more professional. It's most effective workflow. I kind of view it like that. I don't really believe it like it as like there's like it's like some type of inner message in it. Well, yeah, so that's what the, the bosses want for the product or for the business. So the, it's, in, it's ingrained in the children before they even get there from a young age, from the age of five years old in our country. So you're built into this routine. You, you're groomed into this system so that you'll just slot in nicely once you leave school to work for the man in his business and make him lots of money. The man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm just horrifically cynical. <laughs> you know, women own businesses now. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's just men. Barbara it's, Bush, uh... baby. Barbara Bush. <coughs> yeah. Hey, is, uh, is uh, Michelle going to uh, be the next president then? I have no clue. She failed at trying to get kids healthy. She tried at one point. Did that health initiative thing where she was talking about school lunches, should I have a vegetable and all that, and they just gave up on that. <laughs> Really? You don't That's remember so that? No, I don't remember this. It had to be like 12, 13 years ago. I remember turning on the TV when I'd come home from school and she would be like, well, you need at least this many exercise or physical activities a day. And she was wearing a tank top and, uh, yeah. you know, she had her biceps flexing and it shit. And I go, now it's I get out. why people think you're Big Mike. <laughs> That's it. I know. Uh, I don't know. I can't see. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that guy from California, isn't there? Newsom. And uh, it seems like you, could, you just can't see them chucking Kamala under the bus to, to pick another, uh, like, smarmy-looking straight white guy. That's, you know, he's very... I think they will, because I don't think people want her, and they know that they don't want her. That's why I'm saying you got to get Mike, you got to get Michelle in. That's why you got to get Michelle in. She ticks all the boxes, all the diversity boxes that they're so obsessed with. So I think, uh, you know, dark horse for the race. It's not too late to parachute her in 
and take out the orange man for good this time. <laughs> Maybe they should just wrestle. Just fuck off the election. Just have them wrestle in the Why octagon. Why did they just golf like they said they would? That's all I wanted to see. <laughs> oh, that was tragic when they were talking about their handicaps. I just debate. I hope it wakes people up to like none of this matters. Really, it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The fucking clown shoes. Going on about the golf handicaps. They were like Trump took a low bo- blow at Biden and didn't have respect when Biden stumbled on his words or whatever. And um, he like said something and Trump's like, I don't know what he just said. But and then like th- that, I was like, you're an opponent in a debate. Of course, you're going to do that when your opponent slips up. For God's sakes, you guys are calling out cheating on your wives and stuff like that. Like, have a little class and clean it up. Answer the damn question. That's all I wanted. Answer the damn question. No, they don't do that. Politics, politicians are experts at not answering questions directly because that's how you get caught out. <laughs> if you actually answer a question directly, you can be called out on it at a later date. You just have to be as vague as possible. It's fine. Just leave them to it. But I'll be watching with interest come November. Would you go to trying to start like actively seeking things that are looking more towards things that impact your own life? In what, what do you mean? Regulation of technology when it comes to children. Do you have a daughter? No, no, two boys. But, but simple things where it comes to the stuff like how much propaganda can the military send to your son when he gets around drafting age or when he gets around the age to join the military? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm for more for less regulation than more. I think when it comes to kids, it, the book stops with the parents, basically. You shouldn't be expecting laws to be written on your behalf to look after your own kids. You need to do it yourself. You've got to be proactive. I think we're too, we're too, um, I don't want to say it's lazy because it's hard and life's hard and it's busy and we don't have a lot of time and whatnot. But we, we tend to um, subcontract a lot of our parent, parenting out to devices and apps. And it's so easy to just stick a toddler in front of a, an iPad just so they'll be quiet for an hour while you do your laundry or you go and do your shopping, grocery shopping or whatever. So, yeah, I think you got to take responsibility for your own kids. And Is what that lazy parenting, though? I don't I know. I'm probably being harsh saying it's lazy. I just think we, we, we often do what's easiest rather than maybe what's in the best interest or what's best. Because I get it. Because after, like, I had a, my nephews lived with us for three months, four months, just like a month ago. And that was rough, dude. I, you know, like you think you're like, you can handle it. But after like a, a little while, it just gets really tedious, especially working. Like I was working overnights. I was coming home at 745. So I was up all night. That's right when they get up. So then you can't do anything. You can't do a podcast. You can't do anything. It's fine for the first couple of weeks. I really enjoyed it. Um, but then eventually after a while, you're like, I get it. Why parents hand the kid a tablet. It's not lazy parenting, but we have things that now solve them from like the kid won't shut the fuck up. So I, I gave him a tablet. Yeah, but it, it, get, it gets easier after the first 12 years. Yeah. When they're able to actually like get in that teenager state and they just don't want to see you at all. They just want to beat the <laughs> shit out of you. Yeah. Every yeah. time they come down the steps, they go and grab a bottle of water and they like flex and try and like challenge your authority. And you're just. <laughs> You're sitting on the couch like, what? And he's like, what? And you're like, what? <laughs> you know that's what they do. I'm still waiting for that. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. my, dad fixed, my dad fixed that real quick. My, as soon All as right. I did it once, he gave me that one good hit in the, in, the, in the chest, brought me down, and I was like, nope, not ready. Not ready. <laughs> wow. He, he, he silver backed you. Not like anything where it was like, you know, like, I'm going to hit you as hard as I can. Just something where it was like, real quick. He goes, hey, turn around. Yep. Bam. Right. Real, so, so fast. So fast. My grandpa did it too. They know um, when that stuff pops up. I wonder if he learned it from his dad then. Well, they're not related. Oh. Different, different grandparent. Right, right. Yeah. So the strategy is what I'm going to do with my kids real quick. Yeah. Bam. You don't come with a manual, you know. 14-year-old comes down the steps after playing Fortnite for fucking two days straight, using my food and water and my electricity. (laughs) I'm trying to watch Um, some stories. It gets so hyper on. Do you do any video gaming? 
I probably will when we get done with this. I've been trying to. I'm paying for a subscription for 20 something dollars a month and I haven't played it at all. What's that? What are you playing for? Play, PlayStation Network? No, Xbox Game Pass. Xbox Game Pass, right. What, what was, are you playing? For a while, I was like, so when I was working overnights is when I started getting back into video games again. And so for that eight months, I would only have, I'm, I was only awake four hours. So it was either book podcast, guest, do a podcast, or then I'd have a day to play video games. So then I would just play video games. It was Dreamland, Valley Resort, or something like that. It's a Disney game where you just build in a park, like a park, like Thrillville. It was exactly like, it's exactly like Thrillville, but you just build a park Disneyland. It is so easy to follow when you're hammered. It, that's what I, the only like, good part about it is. But then you end up getting like, you're doing all these quests and it goes by real time. So the game goes, if it's daylight in real life, it's daylight in the game. If it's nighttime, it's nighttime in the game. And then it's like certain missions, like only at night you can find it here. I'm like, well, I work overnight, so I don't have a day off. So I'm never going to be able to complete that one. So then I just put it at the ending of the list. Yeah. Right. So no, that kind of sounds a bit like, um, I remember when Sim City came out 25 years ago, probably 30 years ago. And uh, you used to build power plants and housing estates and shit like that. It was really rudimentary at the time. And uh, I just play uh, first-person shooters, basically. I just need something. I don't play it very much now. I've pretty much given up. But if I do play, I need something I can just pick up and play for half an hour and forget, and then forget about it. So I like playing online against humans. And you can just pick it up, shoot some shit half an hour and log off do you feel better when you're able to beat a bunch of people because then you realize you're an above class and the people you're fighting no because i understand that they have skill-based matchmaking and i'm going to be down right at the bottom of the ladder <laughs> so even if i do beat someone i'm beating another 40 year old 41 year old dad who only plays video games once a week for an hour or two <laughs> you know so there's not much uh there's no bragging there's no bragging over that I would like to see a psychology study get done about video games when it comes to specifically online chats and like the lobbies of matchmaking, just the, the, like the number of personalities you meet. That's where you cut your teeth when I was a kid was in those lobbies. You'd have some older dude sitting at home, you know, his girlfriend's getting ready to go to work. He hasn't been to work in months and he's just sitting there like, dude, I booked your mom. And then there's a kid screaming, no, you didn't. And then there's a, one guy just playing his mixtape in the microphone as loud as he possibly oh, can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, I remember when it first. I remember, I think it was a PlayStation 2, Call of Duty. Would it be Modern Warfare? Was maybe the first time I got on online gaming. So it was probably like when it started get sort of, well, when it started to go sort of more mainstream. And you'd have these lobbies, and they were brutal. They were total free for all. I think things are moderated more now, aren't they? And people get kicked and. People get reported for abusive behavior and whatnot. But back in 20 years ago, I mean, it was just ruthless what people would say on uh, Call of Duty. Anything goes sort of stuff. Whereas uh, now, like with my kids, you have controls over who they can talk to and who they can't. So there's a similar study on this question I'm going to ask you, but I want to ask to get to the major point because what I've been focusing on a lot recently do you think video games cause violence or cause people to have violent actions, or do you think it speeds up maybe some that's already inside them, kind of unlocks it? I mean, I don't have anything to back it up. I've not done any research. Just give me your personal but, opinion. But my opinion would be no, it doesn't make people more violent. So all the studies show from the people I've talked to, researchers in the specific area have talked about that it does not cause people to, to be violent, but it can unlock something that's already there. So if somebody's already prone to tending violent action video games can be what would be called trigger for some people who do violent action so the question i want to get to is what i've been talking about which is i was trying to figure out why there was a true crime obsession and why it just randomly sparked up during the pandemic so i had my buddy who's a true crime podcaster on we talked for like almost two hours about like where his focus is how he's evolved through his show what he tends to focus on in the murders the criticisms he gets then i had all these researchers on about it talking about like there is evidence on true crime obsession and everyone points back to the pandemic immediately there was a giant trend with podcasts when podcasts i think went up during the pandemic from i think where our current right now is there's 294,000 podcasts available during the pandemic at its peak there was over 1 million 
um, because everyone's at home. Then after they went back to work, they slowly started weaning off after the next couple of months. People started giving up on it because their work was too hard and stuff like that. And very few people stayed with it. But true crime podcasts have always been the overwhelming majority of top targeted things to listen to is true crime podcasts. And speaking to these researchers, I asked them, is the true crime obsession healthy? And they said, yes, it is healthy because it allows people to have a sense of um, protection. Apparently, being aware of certain instances of a woman, mostly it's a gender-based thing. So for this, they do do largely gender studies on this. They said largely it's women that listen to true crime podcasts, and they use it as a sense of protection to cure some of their anxieties and things. And they are more aware of like this person got killed because they did this action. It was this and this and this. But then there's a question I asked, which was about what happens when someone is really obsessed with a true crime series, but they want to live out a fantasy with it there's still a lot of areas with this true crime obsession that they're learning about and still work needs to be done but from the two people i've spoken to about it they've talked about that there is people that want to live out their fantasy and it could be more of a therapy type thing a lot of people aren't necessarily serial killers or violent people they just have aggression and anger and a lot of things inside of them that they it can express much like when you saw someone like hmm you want to squeeze their head and do that little thing you used to do as a kid it's just as simple as like doing something like that. So it actually has shown a ben benefit to cognitive function and a mood enhancing thing as well, too, by getting sucked into these true crime experiences. And then there's different pathways if you focus more on the victim compared to um, focusing more on the serial killer. But there's that fascination with all of us wanting to be a detective and solve clues and shits. Why conspiracies are so fascinating. Problem solving. It, it taps into the the the, the natural um proclivity that we have db for... cooper baby db cooper yeah uh, the other thing um it seems to me and maybe i'm wrong on this but one of the things that kicked off the true crime boom was making a murderer on netflix i don't know if you ever saw that show it was a few years ago it was before i think it was before the pandemic but um but one of the things that was interesting about that was the sort of the hints of miscarriage of justice so there was a genuine question mark over whether the guy was guilty or not. And the way they shot the documentary left it open. They tried to, they filmed it and edited it in a way where you felt that the guy might have been set up. And so that, that brings another element of intrigue, isn't there? That there may be a huge miscarriage of justice or there's a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy by the authorities to finger someone who's innocent. I've talked to a lot of people and I'm like, I mean, a lot of people, um, but I've been called a conspiracy theorist about many subjects and probably sure. I'm pretty sure a lot of people probably think I am, but mostly it's the JFK shit. But when I can show a fact-based document-based approach to something like that, there's just for a lot of people, they just don't, they don't want to open up their mind to looking at certain documentation and certain things like that. It's like when I see true crime people, I probably do the same thing. I know plenty of friends that are interested in true crime. To me, it's just a horrible, dark subject, and I have no interest of listening to it. But I like learning why people get interested in the subject. Yeah, that's interesting. I never twigged that um, the reason for that gender divide. Because again, I don't listen to true crime stuff, and it's not something I really want to. But now I'm thinking about it, the people who I know who do enjoy true crime podcasts all tend to be female I, I i asked the guy about it because we were talking about the perpetrators and it's largely men that are the perpetrators of this true, true crime which i thought it would have been the women because there's a lot of serial killer women too that people don't really talk about but it's not necessarily um it's more a crime of passion um mostly it's involved in situations like domestic disputes uh, where they see a large uptick with um, women doing certain killings through domestic disputes. Now, when it is a domestic violence issue where it's just beating, it is men. Um, so there's a weird thing with that statistic. But I asked him, I go, is there a way to use hormones to be able to test and like dumb someone's testosterone down? Because if it's a largely a male factor, that's testosterone. I'm like, that's that would be the only significant difference. It's not about body weight. It's not about size because anybody can kill anybody with a gun or whatever. But the violent action, that is testosterone. And he, he mentioned to me, he was like, I mean, we, we don't have science really to try and specifically target hormones. But we could try hormone blockers. That might be some area to look into. He thought it was really interesting. But uh, I don't know. To me, I was maybe that would 
solve some of that stuff. I don't know. A lot of guys get more violent stuff, but usually it's like you punch somebody, you guys get into a fight, and the next thing you know, you shake hands and you're done. Yeah, ben, men tend to work out the differences quick, more, <laughs> more immediately, don't they? With fisticuffs or a quick brawl, and then it's over and done with. Whereas you're um, so full of fucking piss and vinegar that you you know you end up like sitting there months you know wife hasn't touched you in forever next thing you know you're fighting with a dude at a red light and then you're like oh I'm sorry man I was just you know had to get all that out of me drain your juices drain your juices people so you get to my age and then your testosterone starts going through the floor and you just don't care anymore I might get breast implants next that's so dangerous when your testosterone starts dropping because I didn't realize how much it affects your life. Yeah, apparently it's like for guys, it's a giant mood leveler. Um, especially like if you're like they, it's it's mostly in common with alcoholics. If you're an alcoholic, they're more nervous because alcohol kills testosterone in the body, and they say that's actually what contributes a lot for men and their weight gain when they drink a lot of alcohol. It's not necessarily the bloating from the alcohol; it's because your testosterone is being dumbed down. So that's why I started taking testosterone boosters. I started noticing it. I was like, I work out extremely, but like. There's just like that little alcohol bloat you can't get off. And I realized taking testosterone boosters helps keep it up. But then my beard started coming in more. And I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Like, you see, I got on the fucking sides going down. I wonder if I should get it tested. You can get your levels checked, can't yeah. you, for testosterone? I've never had any tests done for anything. I've never I don't had think any it's low, but it can always be higher. It can, it can always be higher. More is better. Is that the rule of thumb? Especially with testosterone. Can't have too much. <laughs> but that's also when I quit my job and said all I'm doing this summer is drinking booze and fuck. <laughs> Maybe it affects your decision making then, Robin. I literally told my buddy, let's go get a steak. He's like, you have it. You don't eat red meat. I was like, I know. <laughs> let's go get a steak. Do you not eat red meat generally? No, I'm, I'm, uh, my diet's one egg a day. That's it. Yeah, with a salad. <laughs> Fucking hell. Well, that's also why I have like six pack and 6% body fat, so. Yeah, but you not get hungry. No, um, with like my ADHD, as long as I'm doing something, I don't get, really get hungry. Really? Yeah. So, just like I told you, when I went to DC in November, I had an orange for breakfast after doing six hours of cardio, and all I did was pile drinks on top of it the whole time, and I didn't eat till nine p.m. that night. But that's the thing: if you sit me down in front of food, I will immediately feel the reaction of being hungry. Like right now, now we're talking about it, I just got hungry. Right. Right. You see, yeah, this is what um, a lot of people, they snack in the evenings, and it's when they've nothing to do. So people finish work and they have the main meal in the evening or whatever, and then they go to put the kids to bed, and they come downstairs and they stick Netflix on, and they've nothing to do, and that's when they go to the cupboard and reach for the biscuits or the chips or whatever. Because, you, you, yeah, you, you're kind of bored. And so that's when you notice the hunger pang and you... Just want to, you're just eating for the sake of it, essentially. Eating healthy is not hard, but I understand when people get addicted to food because, like, if you are like, it's like when you're drunk and you're eating food, you just get hungry after drinking, like, not even like an hour or two later. It's like you lose that connection with the mind and the stomach. But I get where people go, like, I just can't stop. It's like, yeah, have you ever been really hungry and it happens like every three hours or something like that? Like usually around the time you eat and then saying, no, you can't eat, but you have to eat to survive. It's a fucked up like paradox that we, we go through as human beings. I mean, that's all of humanity is just like this kind of counter. I hate myself. I love myself. You know, like, for instance, most people walk around and look in the mirror. Oh, I would change this. I would change this. I would change this. And then when they're drinking, they're like, I'm fucking damn sexy. <laughs> just don't have any mirrors in the house that's an easy way around that yeah but when you're drunk you want to look at yourself oh yeah i don't know how many times i walk past the car three or four times just to stare at myself in the reflection <laughs> <laughs> oh my god mr narcissus low-key low-key i'm low pretty key. good at keeping my ego in check yeah Hey, that's not easy said, easier said than done, though, isn't it? But then when I'm drinking, I just go out and be like, yo, I'll tell you who killed JFK right now. <laughs> Sit down. Pick up a pen. Better take notes. Oh, dude, I could go off. My buddy always asks me questions about it when we're drinking. He's like, all right, so give me the right, latest breakdown. But I always try and be balanced with it. But I will go into it for like a good hour and a half. 
I'm gonna have to um, look at your YouTube shorts. Do you have your computer right now? Just pull it up. Well, hang on. I have to go to. Uh, Unless it takes you down a road. YouTube. There's just a lot of things that I feel like. I don't know. I don't know why some of the stuff trends, some of the stuff doesn't, but <sighs> it's. I like it that there's a lot, a wide range of things for people. Supercharge to your business with the Oops, all new. Oh. Sorry, sorry. I was got an advert. Uh, it wouldn't let me click on your channel. Look at that. Five, five and a half thousand subscribers, Robbie. It's going up. Wow. Yeah, I can see your shorts. Not the ones you're wearing. I mean, your YouTube shorts. Well, they have pineapples on it if you're, if you're able to yeah. see that. Best part well, about a Zoom is from the waist up. GFK stuff. This is so, it's such a deep subject, isn't there? It you is, know, consider a lot of, of short 30 seconds, 30 seconds for a short. I mean, you must be able to do millions of them on JFK. It's just yeah, a subject. About, I think I had like maybe 60, 70 something testimonies and there's like 600 and something that were interviewed by the commission or 600 names out there. At least the one Henry Gonzalez, I didn't know. Um, he uh, was in the motorcade. He was car number four. He was at Parkland Hospital, and he took photos of the limousine, and he also took photos of Kennedy. Um, when he went back to D Washington, D.C., two weeks later, he went to San Antonio with the three cameras that he had on the route, um, and he had put them in his car. And he specifically, in his own letter, says, I specifically locked my car, went inside to his office, came back down. His car was unlocked, and his cameras were gone. So his cameras with the photos of JFK were gone. Now, he f reported it to the police, and then he went and found his cameras that ended up uh, – they were fenced. Um, and, but when he got them back, there was no film in it. So someone took the film of the JFK stuff out. And he even says – he's like – I he, he ended up serving on the House Select Committee on Assassinations um, that were the second investigation into the president's death that, con that said probable conspiracy. Um, but he literally was serving on there and he goes, I'm not here to, you know, engage in conspiracy theories or enhance any conspiracy theories, but I believe that there hasn't been an official investigation into the president's death. And I also believe all the files should be released. I was like, yeah, everybody is on board with that last part. No, there are so many, everyone on the HSCA, everyone on the Warren commission believes that all the information should be in the public's domain, but there's just some differences. I think it's only three or four members of the Warren Commission um, did not agree with the official conclusions. Um, and then the ones that didn't at the time did later. So eventually all people of the Warren Commission did eventually say that the, they don't believe it was alone. Even LBJ said it. LBJ didn't believe Oswald did it. And that's on tape. I was just looking through it. I just clicked on most popular, on your most popular shorts. It's JFK, 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 JFK. Spartan Steve. <laughs> Steve Spartan's there. Yeah. <laughs> there. I love that guy. Yeah, me and him had an episode. If you listen to that one that we did, I just went deep into everything. I, making those clips is the most informative ever because for me, I have to go dig up what this person says. And it caused me to read through web page after web page after book after book after book after document after document after document. So I'm soaking up the information, trying to find it and highlight it. And um, eventually I start knowing things by name. And I brought Steve on and me and him just went deep into all the stuff like Lysurgis and all these different names that come up in ancient history um, and certain theories and ideas and Spartan beliefs and the Spartan mirage that um, people talk about, which... I, I do believe there's a Spartan mirage. There's a lot of propaganda. I believe their own propaganda. Uh, they believe their own propaganda at a certain point. Yeah, I like uh, I like Steve. I'd love to have him back on, but I don't. Because we're live, and because of where he is in the world, it just doesn't work with the time, the time frame. Otherwise, I'd have him back in a heartbeat. But I don't want to ask him because it means him having to get up at like three in the morning or four in the morning or something stupid. I'll just shoot him a message. He's he's going to be putting out his new sh new episodes coming up. I made his I made his new logo that came. I made his old one. Now I made him a, I made him a new one. And then um, because yeah, he's given me so much time. We recorded on like two separate occasions. One to do an hour where we just did clips, um, little things I got to clip up and segment. And then the second time was to do an actual episode. 
Um, so I said, yeah, man, I, I made you this little uh, new logo for his thing, and he's going to be using it when he drops his new season. He's been taking a break for a couple months. Yeah. Cool. I'll be listening to that when it comes out. Spartan History Podcast. Yep. Check it out, folks. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. What about other things, ancient-wise, have you looked into or thought about? Oh, gosh. Everything. Always. Dream interpretation. <laughs> I'm terrible at, dream, at dreaming. Why? All these people who never remembers. Are you never boozing remembers. before you sleep? No, no, I'm not a big drinker. I don't know what it is. I, I've been told that you've got to, what you have to do is write it down as soon as you wake up. Because what tends to happen is you, you do remember your dreams, but only very briefly when you first wake up and then you go back to sleep and it's, it's gone. So I should, people keep a, is it called a dream diary? I think it's a dream diary yeah. people where they write down their experiences. And uh, another, Carl Jung, going back to Carl Jung, he was another one of these uh, dream interpretation guys. But yeah, no, I'm not very good. Not much of a dreamer. The last ancient history book I read was about uh, Babylon. Babylon. Sumeria. It's all about ancient Sumer, Mesopotamia, and Babylon. The Hanging Gardens and all that. It's, uh, I don't know, it's kind of trying to piece the piece our story back together. We've just got sort of fragments of our history and it's trying to piece it together into like a grand narrative. Do you believe there was ever a place on Earth that was considered the Eden or Utopia? Oh, probably not. No. I think all societies have tried to forge their idea of a Utopia or um, Eden, but I don't know if we have any remnants of those perfect societies left. I know people theorize about Atlantis and stuff like that, like a perfect yeah. city. I mean, some, some people would argue like a hunter-gatherer community would be about as close as you're going to get where you might have like true egalitarianism, uh, freedom, unlike anything known on the planet today. I suppose it still probably exists in some, because there are uncontacted tribes. Uh, there's all sorts of wicked stories. Like when a lot Again, of times... back to your major point. Did you see that what happened with that tribe that they found? And like, I forgot off the coast of whatever, West Somalia or something like that. They found a tribe that had no technology, nothing. They had been completely, they didn't speak English or anything. They introduced them to phones. And within, th within three days, they were all looking at porn. Oh, why'd they ruin it for them? They exposed them. <laughs> they should have been they should have like a prime directive a non-interference policy when it comes to uncontacted they tribes they usually do with some of that stuff but for this one I forgot what it was but it's kind of like the sub that went under to see the Titanic and it just it exploded a lot of people had different takes on that mm. what, what takes? one that it was like they shouldn't have been down there anyway fuck those people because they we're going down in a sub like idiots, like rich billionaires exposing a piece of historical grave site. Then there's another take where it's like, I don't know, like that's so sad. I was in the boat of like, that's so sad for them. Yeah, they shouldn't be down there, but that's, you know, it's a loss of human life. A, a kid was in there um, as well, too. Um, and then the real issue I have is the news broadcasting of it. Uh, the news said that they... I'm going to make sure I don't get this wrong. The news said that they're still looking for them and they might be down there without any oxygen. Um, and then later the story changed that, that their sub exploded on impact uh, or, or or when it hit a certain level, it just kind of crushed in. And they basically were like dead within 0.3 milliseconds or something like that, um, which is is not true. The government was said that they were they made news broadcasting they're searching for this sub to try and find them the first couple of days because they only had a certain amount of oxygen left and eventually just became looking for like remnants um the government already had a recording of the explosion underwater and they knew that was the sub and they told the media that but the media kept the story going and really tried to profit off the views like they've done with Gabby Petito and a bunch of those other scenarios that always pop up and end up trending in the news for months and everyone completely forgets about it. That was the twisted thing about that was the media portrayal, the, the stringing out of the story. It must have been a slow news week 
So they wanted to string this story out for an extra couple of days. It's really funny because at the time it happened, I was doing a job for a guy who was a retired Royal Navy submariner. And he'd worked on British Navy submarines all his life. And uh, he's, he, I, was, I was asking him about the thing and he started laughing when uh, it's because it, it, it was in the pay, it was on the news at the time that, you know, they were trying to make contact or they were trying to find the submarine. And he started laughing and he said, um, he said, the Americans know if a dolphin farts in the Atlantic, they've got that many sort of sensors, they've got that much yeah. technology monitoring the, the ocean. But he said the Americans knew what happened the, the moment it happened. And and that that came to be the case eventually, didn't it? The Americans admitted that they picked up the I don't know was it a seismograph or something they picked up the explosion, or implosion rather. But yeah, it's sad. And that the guy who owned the company is still around, isn't he? Was it his son who was on board? He was in there with it. Was he in there with it? Oh, yeah. Because they couldn't do anything. It was basically just like a group suicide. They couldn't. They couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't get nobody. Whenever in a scenario like that happens, somebody is going to jail. But in this scenario, you can't because everyone's dead. So, and now there's that one guy, billionaire, talking about doing it, but making the sub better, and it, his sub won't go up. I'm like, it's like naming a boat the Titanic. Remember, they're doing that. The the sub that they made a giant cruise line that's like twelve times the size of the Titanic, and they're calling it the Titanic. I'm like, you're going to literally jinx yourself. Like, <laughs> don't do that. And there's that one guy that survived the Titanic story too. What's that? There were people so that survived the Titanic, but the one guy who survived it by drinking nothing but alcohol. You know that guy? Oh, the chef. That was yeah, the chef. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to find it now. Damn it! Where's it gone? Ah, uh, I've got a book. Here it is. Uh, you, you'd like this, Robbie. Titanic, the ship that never sunk by Robin Gardner. It's a conspiracy book about the Titanic. It's all about the Titanic and the Olympic getting switched. Oh, what about the, um, they stopped all the payments to all the employees at like a certain time after the ship sunk uh. or something like that? Oh, there's all sorts. All about the the signaling flares. Uh, Marconi's implicated implicated in it. The Marconi radio, the game, guy who invented radio, or whatever it was, radio telecoms. Um, J.P. Morgan, Standard Oil, uh, the Astors. There's all sorts of weirdness. In you the should read the trial of transcript of the chef that survived. Yeah, I bet. I bet part of it's transcribed in that book. You know, he had to go to court because they were wondering how he survived and how he did it. And they were making him feel like he was on trial. He was like, I don't know. I just drank. I thought I was done. So I just started tossing women and children in the lifeboats. And I was just expecting that I was going to meet my end. And I didn't die when I hit the water. I ended up swimming or floating for two hours. And because apparently all the alcohol had and the cold uh, alcohol won over. So he had liquid -like courage. Um, but then also his blood vessels had frozen not frozen but closed off and certain parts of his body got to maintain heat and other parts didn't and it kept it near his vital organs because if you drink alcohol you know they talk about that warm feeling you get when you drink alcohol it's because it's keeping all your blood to your organs um because that's what your body does whenever you're like either doing something bad or you're uh close to like something that could be new or dangerous and that your body tries to put it to its vital organs that's why everyone always loses limbs whenever they get injured I think the uh, conclusion from Robin Gardner's book was that the chef never even went in the water. Well, fuck that book. I don't want to read that. I like it that a chef was just boozing the whole time. Didn't he have to, wouldn't he have had to hold his breath for an ungodly amount of time to have made it down, to have been pulled in by the, by the, the boat and then swim to the surface? What do you mean? Yeah, I don't. Because the, when the ship, ship sinks, it drags everything in with it. And you, you're... He was, when it slowly it. started going down, he jumped off. Yeah, he jumped off and just, <laughs> I'm not buying it. A I'm lot of people jumped. <laughs> yeah, and I think a lot of them would have instantly died as soon as they hit the water from uh, cold shock. Yeah, just well, that's the alcohol that cut off all that cold shock stuff. Yeah, I'm not buying it. I don't know. I like that myth. Even if it is a myth, let me have it. <laughs> hey, we'll never know because we weren't there. 
We'll never know. It may be true. It may not be. I don't know. I don't know. There's too many things that's, uh, what's it called? Uh, destroying. No, it's destroying the past to protect the fairy tale. Oh. It's in well, largely JFK groups. There's a whole forum about it, about um, witnesses, film footage, anything you could possibly know. There's this group thread on one of these forums. It's called destroying the past to protect the fairy tale. About the lies, the omissions, the things that came later, um, certain things that are kind of unexplainable. Um, stuff you can search for ever and try and find but the best part about the volumes of the jfk stuff is that they made 26 volumes with millions of documentation where if you find something if you don't screenshot it try finding it again is impossible i have too many clip testimonies i need to make clips for but i can't remember where i wrote down the testimonies from so i have to search all these databases archives and stuff like that and it's just you end up getting like fuck i can't do this one so you can't just save like web links anymore. You've got to download stuff and keep it on a separate hard drive. You can, but when you're drinking doing this, it's not easy to remember to do all that type of shit. You already have to cut their testimony down to a minute to fit the clip. Right, yeah, yeah. People just assume that if it's on the internet, it'll be there forever. But stuff gets wiped. Yeah, but if but you look up Henry Gonzalez, what I just told you earlier about JFK, if you type it in on the internet and hit videos, my clip pops up. So now I have an, really what happened was I was tired of hearing things from people, then trying to look for it and I couldn't find it. So I got so pissed off. I said, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm just going to put everybody's testimony online. So now everyone can go and get, jump aboard and it worked. Wow. You filled a niche. There's a little niche There's that people wanted. Anger, piss, and vinegar that got me all <laughs> in that boat. <laughs> so are you going to carry on with the JFK shorts? Yeah, I'm going to do it. I just, it's so easy, and it's actually fun for me because I'm learning more about it. But Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I just can't. I'm not in, like into a subject that hardcore. I'm too much of a shotgun. I just move from one thing to the next. Maybe if, I was going to say I have a short attention span, but I don't think that's it. I'm like that with like the true crime stuff I was mentioning earlier, but it's just the JFK ones kind of. Well, isn't that not a true crime story, JFK? Yeah, I mean, it is, but people have moved it into the conspiracy realm because it adds in a lot of theories and factors that necessarily aren't. I was more surprised at the number of people that were working in government positions that were aware of the fact of not having disclosure breeds conspiracies. I don't think anybody would have predicted it would have gotten this big, but I think all, if not most, government officials at one point have said that they don't believe the official line of thinking. Wow. Sorry, one sec. Ew. Blood? No. That was disgusting. That Sorry. just made me throw up in my mouth. Ugh, I had to blow my nose. I was all bunged up. For the I audio listeners, we're not going to tell you what he did. <laughs> you probably hear it in my voice. I'm all nasally and bunged up. Oh. Are you getting better at all, though? Oh, better than I was yesterday. Apparently that vitamin D is not doing shit. Uh, well, what if I wasn't taking it, though? Maybe I'd be ten times worse. I hate those games. That toss <laughs> me in the realm of hypothetical shit. I'm proving negative. Yeah. You could have been sicker. That's why you took it, so it actually helped you. I was like, you don't fucking know that. Nobody knows. You said Game of Thrones before. Have you seen the new Game of Thrones yet? I haven't watched any episodes. No, I haven't yet. I'm waiting for them to all be released, and then I'm gonna get because you got to pay, like, uh, for the t for some app on your TV to watch the new Game of Thrones. So I'm gonna wait till they're all out, and then I'm gonna pay for one month, and then watch them all in one go. That's what I did with well, the Fallout series when they released them all. Yeah, I liked the first season of House of the Dragon when it came out. I thought it was interesting. It's good fun. I like I like dragons and tits. So I'll watch this one, I think. I'll give it a go. Sound like me taking test tes testosterone boosters. <laughs> <sighs> I've not watched the boys at all either. You gotta watch ben, that. Ben talks about that. Oh, just really? I, I... Matt said it's getting worse. Each season's getting progressively worse. There's uh they try to go woke with it. 
on this new season, but then they kind of make it fun of it. Like there's certain characters that will like say stuff that obviously is in PC, but also the woman on there is like getting a lot of shit because she was like really hot in the first couple of seasons. But then I guess she must have got her actor actress paycheck because she got a shit ton of cosmetic surgery done. And people are like, yo, fucking Skeletor. And I'm like, that's so mean because she got her jaw done and everything. But I was like, if anything, it shows you that we all have self-doubt in ourselves about every single one little detail or something like that. Even people you think are just drop dead gorgeous. It's just, it, and that's what some people do when they get money. Like I said, I had literally five friends get fake tits and they're in their twenties. Why do you need those? In the twenties. Why do you need those in your twenties? Is it because they want to be like Instagram models? So? No, it's because they might've been self-conscious that they didn't really have a big chest you know, through school and stuff like that. But literally, I know so many people that have done that. And I'm like, that's so bad because those can like really cause damage longer in life. How much of this do you think comes from these girls actually being on Instagram and being fed these fake? Oh, I'm sure that's uh, a big portion of it. You know, these glammed up um, people. Oh, what do they call it? Where people sort of put forward their fake life, like their best life on instagram you only see the best things you never see when things go wrong or, or whatnot well why would you show off when your life's shit yeah exactly and people do that but now then, they complain about something but people compare themselves then they go onto instagram and they compare their life and how they feel with this like unrealistic expectation of what life could be by this this profile which isn't even real it's it's a real person but it's it's cultivated it's a manufactured profile and people then end up comparing themselves to that and that's why they end up getting fake tits when they're 23. i used to bitch about the fact that you could see guys nipples on movies but you couldn't see a girl's i thought it was like a weird double stamp like what the hell that's not fair but then i realized that we can come across girls with fake tits on instagram but you'll never see a guy with a fake dick on instagram <laughs> So maybe it's a good balance. Nature tends to work itself out. He's going around with fake dicks. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason you're not seeing people walking around with fake dicks is because they don't exist. Yes, they do. <laughs> they fuck. There's a whole community pushing to be. Why, I've just got a dick job. <laughs> got there, a first of all, there is that where they do stick a metal rod in there to extend it out to its like a permanent length. And one guy did die doing that because it is a very dangerous procedure, but it does what it does is it makes like as soft. It makes it as full as it would if it was erect. Why not just stick a fucking brat verse down your trousers? People did that too. So why are you telling me people showing around, not showing around fake dicks? Yeah, everyone does. I don't believe you. There's people wandering around with fake dicks. I'm sure there is. That's how the dude died on A Thousand Ways to Die. He wrapped a surgical hose around a sausage around his leg and it cut off the circulation and killed him. Oh my God. Some god people was... aren't happy. Thank God I was blessed. The only thing, if I met a genie, I would just ask for one more inch so I could hit double digits. Right, okay. Good. Good for you. I'm happy for you. Thank you. Is that girth or length? It, it's reverse. It goes inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. Fuck, I've got a headache. You made me laugh hard just, then. Just wait till people start getting gene splicing with animals. They're going to find a horse and ask for the... Do you what think do you gonna a horse gonna cock. You're going to end up with hybrids. I'm ha like, yeah, look, hang out their shorts. Human hybrids. That's Robin Williams' joke, by the way. When he talks about getting a different valve in his heart, he's like, well, what other animal parts can you put in your body? He's like, can I get a horse cock so I could just hang out my shorts? And he's like, maybe if you get a cow valve in your heart, you could shit standing up. <laughs> <laughs> he's like one of my favorite comedians besides Norm MacDonald. Well, he never used to get, he wasn't really known for his stand-up in the UK. Well, he, for a while, was getting a lot of trash from other comedians because he was stealing people's material and using it on stage. Yeah, but I, a lot of people think it's because of how bad he wanted to kill. Like, he wanted to make people laugh so hard that he would end up subconsciously using someone else's joke just so he could get the laugh. 
Um, he necessarily wasn't just like, oh, that's a good bit. I'm going to steal it. It was more like he would just reiterate a lot of jokes that he heard just to be funny. Always in the moment for him was always you had to be funny, 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 funny. And, um, it, that, you know, that's a lot of people look at that like, oh, he's just a jokester. It's like, well, a lot of times people just don't like the awkward silence. They just feel like a joke needs to be every couple of seconds. There has to be something going on. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. One of my eldest kid, his favorite movie is Mrs. Doubtfire. And it's such a fucked up premise. The guy so dressing I, up as a woman? Well, the guy, well, he's, he's left by his wife. He's a dysfunctional parent who's left by his wife. So he decides to gender swap to ingratiate himself with his ex-wife and be closer to his children. It is a fucked up movie. It's weird. It's fucking weird. Well, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. But isn't white chicks weirder? I've never seen that. Where the two guys go undercover and they steal these uh, costumes, look like these girls, these white girls. Wait, 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 this, isn't it? Yeah, but it's like um, that it's it's that movie and then Deuce Bigelow, not Deuce Bigelow. Um, the other one Rob Schneider's in where he body swaps with the girl. Remember that? He's um Rob Schneider ends up playing like a female uh or a guy that gets a bad curse on him that switches into a female and the female's like a high school girl and he's at a sleepover and they're having a pillow fight and he's wearing girls panties oh and, yeah um Freaky Friday no that's with that one girl I forgot her name now damn it she's in the Michael series <laughs> Lohan. No, the other one. Who's the other one? Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> I'm terrible at films. I always get them mixed up. Oh, my gosh. Am I hurting you by keeping going? We could stop if you want. I'm, pr I'm probably about done now. I've got to walk my dog in a minute. You give me enough time anyway. I always appreciate our chats. I'm glad we got to get back together and have a discussion. I don't really remember what we talked about, but it seems like we covered some ground. Yeah, well, it's just all part of the rich tapestry of life, isn't it, Robbie? All right, let's put you in the cryo tube. And... <laughs> you really got to trust somebody to make sure they can monitor that fucking thing. Like, if you well, just decide, okay. like, what happens you if you, you just leave for a week, everyone goes on vacation, and then next thing you know, you come back and the janitor's like, ah, oh, I don't want to clean that up. People are just puddles. How do you become a puddle? That's the thing where you just ooze. Yeah. Well, 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 because it's like, you know, if you, if your power goes off to, to your f freezer or your food just turns to mush, that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, but when you, they thaw you, you out, what happens? You decompose. But when they, thaw, when they thaw you out, what happens? Don't you decompose the same? How do they thaw you out? I don't think they've thought it through, have they? <laughs> It's the biggest Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yeah. It's like selling a timeshare. How to separate rich idiots from their money. 101. Give me a million dollars, and after you die, I'll keep you on ice. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> then everybody's getting in like horrible car accidents, and they're just tossing in the tubes and getting the insurance. You're right. It's a Ponzi scheme. Definitely. More Where fuel them. Where can people find you, Phil? YouTube is probably the best place now. Search for us on YouTube. It's the best place. All right. Well, if, you, if you're in the UK, 8, 8 p.m. UK time every Sunday, pretty much, you can join us live and join in. Join in the fun. Have a laugh. Have a laugh. We'd like to have a laugh. What, what? I'm going to link all your links in the description. Thank you again. And thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.